Your friends in Christ, how would you finish this sentence? Just like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Just like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. This catchy slogan is one of the longest used commercial advertising jingles in the history of advertising. It's been used by State Farm Insurance since 1971. That's 48 years. Now, it was written, it was written by the singer-songwriter Barry Manilow. And he was paid the princely sum of $500 for this jingle. Now, just recently, within the last two years, State Farm has stopped using the lyrics, but they still use the melody to this jingle. At the very least, the last four notes are found at the end of every television commercial. Now, this slogan implies that there are certain qualities that make a person or an insurance company a good neighbor. Today, we look at the words of Jesus for the qualities that make a good Christian neighbor. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus gave us a much broader meaning of the word neighbor than most of us are comfortable with, but a meaning that encourages us to show Christ-like love and Christ-like concern to those in need. Good Samaritan, <coughs> Good Samaritan is probably one of the most widely recognized parables in the Bible. For one thing, it's, it's a good story. It's timeless in its message and in its challenge. But it's a multi-layered story that is often oversimplified. We need to analyze this lesson today layer by layer to get to the heart of the message. Verse 25 begins, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. The simple question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the first layer of the parable. Now, to be fair, this was a loaded question. The title lawyer indicates that this man was an expert in the law, the Mosaic law, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, we don't know his name, but we do know is that he came to Jesus with a question to test Jesus. He wanted to test Jesus' understanding of the law. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus didn't give an answer, as was often the case. Jesus instead directed the lawyer back to scripture, and, and he, he replied, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Jesus knew the lawyer had an answer. He simply wanted to hear it from the lawyer's lips. So the lawyer answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this, and you will live. Just as the lawyer asked a loaded question, Jesus replied with a loaded answer. Do this, and you will live. Love God, love your neighbor as you are commanded in the Bible, and you will inherit eternal life. As a student of the law, this man knew God's standard of obedience. All throughout Leviticus, this phrase is repeated, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And Jesus had earlier affirmed and validated this same uh, command when he said, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, Keep the law perfectly. Be holy. Keep the law without any errors whatsoever, and you will inherit eternal life. Talk about a loaded answer. But Jesus wanted the lawyer to see the futility of using obedience to the law to gain eternal life. Jesus wanted the lawyer to see his need for Jesus. The indication that the lawyer understood what Jesus meant is found in the next verse from Luke chapter 10, but he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? What's the lawyer really asking? Well, he's trying to, to narrow the field of those whom he is to love as he loves himself. He's trying to exclude responsibility for others by making some people 
non-neighbors. So Jesus responded with a story. That's the next layer that is revealed. The story, the parable, took place on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho, a notoriously dangerous route. In Jesus' day, the old road between Jerusalem and Jericho was a 17-mile path with narrow, rocky pass stretches and blind turns. It made it just a perfect place for robbers to ambush people who were traveling. Now, this would have been common knowledge for the original listeners to this parable. No one would be surprised that a human being was mugged and beaten and left for dead along the side of that road. But that's all we know about the victim. We don't know if he was young or old, if he was Gentile or Jewish, if he was a wealthy person or a poor person, whether he was a good person or a bad person. Now he's just a naked, completely vulnerable, beaten up person left for dead on the side of the road. In fact, we know more about the people who passed him by than we do about this poor victim. The first passerby was a priest. The priest is one of those religious leaders who were most knowledgeable of the law. The priest knew that if this man were dead, and if he touched this dead man, he would be ceremonially unclean. He would lose his right to officiate in the temple until he underwent a ceremonial cleansing. So he didn't stop and help because he wanted to be able to do his job. He wanted to be able to serve God, so he passed the man by. Now, to be fair, he might have had compassion for this poor victim, but the, the guidelines of his job kept him from doing the right thing. The second passerby was a Levite, another religious official. Levites were temple uh, workers. The Levite wouldn't have had as many restrictions on him as the priest did. He could have rendered aid and not been in trouble, legally or ceremonially. And he did approach the man. Luke says that the Levite came to the place and saw him. Oh, why did he pass by? Well, maybe he was afraid of the same fate, that the same fate would befall him as uh, the victim, that he would be attacked and, and beaten and robbed, so he scurried on his way out of fear. Or maybe, maybe he didn't know the helpless man's religion or social class, and so he didn't see him as a neighbor, as someone who deserved his help. The third passerby was a Samaritan. Now, this was as if Jesus said, a low-life, good-for-nothing scum of the earth came by. There were centuries of animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were cursed daily in the Jewish synagogues, and prayers were lifted up, hoping that the Samaritans would not be partakers of eternal life. Now, that's a pretty significant hatred, don't you think? Praying that somebody goes to hell. But like a good neighbor, the Samaritan was there. This Samaritan went above and beyond reasonable expectations in helping the beaten man. Not only did the Samaritan render basic aid and, and show compassion to a complete stranger, he bound up the man's wounds, gave him clothes, put him on his donkey, took him to an inn, paid for room and food, and promised to come back and be there for him in the days to come as he recovered. So when he finished the story, uh, Jesus asked the expert in the law, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? A lawyer couldn't even bring himself to spit out the word Samaritan. He simply mumbled the one who had mercy on him. Jesus replied, go and do likewise. We're at the next layer of this lesson. The point of the story isn't what I have to do to earn eternal life, or what do I have to do to get right with God. Uh, this is more than just a story about morality and being nice, because anybody can be good. Even unbelievers or non-Christians can do the right thing on occasion. Even unbelievers or non-Christians can follow the golden rule, doing to others what they want others to do to them. If Jesus wanted us to take home the golden rule,
from this passage, the title of the parable would have been The Good Person. But it wasn't. It's entitled The Good Samaritan. In this story, the unexpected element is the fact that an unwanted, despised, and rejected Samaritan is the one who showed mercy to a complete unknown who might even have been his enemy. The teachable element is the fact that a despised Samaritan was like a good neighbor to the man in need. Now we peel back another layer. It's one thing to know the right thing, it's another thing to do the right thing. A lawyer knew the right thing to say, but Jesus pushed the lawyer to think not with his mind, but with his heart. Actually, this parable is about a change of heart. It's about how believers' hearts are changed and continue to change by the Holy Spirit working through God's Word, working through the sacraments. It's about how you, with your changed heart, will feel compassion for somebody in need. Not motivated out of a desire to earn eternal life, but motivated out of gratitude and love for God. Jesus was really explaining his mission to the lawyer. Jesus came to take the I and the me out of our soul's salvation. Jesus came, as Luther said, as God's good Samaritan. <clears throat> Jesus came because we can't pull ourselves out of the brokenness and the bondage of sin which engulfs us each day. We can't save ourselves no matter how much we try. To the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replies, nothing. You can't save yourself. That's his job. It's the sacrifice of his life that pays the penalty for our sin. Through faith in Jesus, believers are lifted up out of that ditch. We are redeemed, restored, forgiven, and we are empowered to live for Jesus. In the parable, the Good Samaritan promised to return and follow the progress of the beaten and robbed man. Now, how do you think this man responded a couple days later when the Samaritan returned for a visit to check and see that he was healing? Considering the extent of this man's injuries and the lack of help from anybody else, I'm sure this man was grateful beyond all measure. He was thankful that his life had been spared. We too are grateful for the salvation won for us by Jesus. He saved us not only from the ditches of life, but from an eternity in hell. We have so much for which we can be thankful. This sense of gratitude and thankfulness is the only proper motive to compel us to do good to others. Service to others is not done for a reward from God. That reward, eternal life, is given to us believers as a free gift, no strings attached. Our service to the Lord, our response to the Lord, our sacrifice comes from a changed heart, a loving heart, a heart that's been loved so much by Christ that it wants to love others in return. Jesus has removed us from the ditches of life and put us in positions where now we can help our neighbors. So the parable of the Good Samaritan is not telling us how believers should act. It is showing how believers will act toward our neighbor in loving response to our Lord and Savior. The way we love our neighbor is simply a reflection of God's love in us. Neighbor is not defined by how close a person lives to you or whether they're from the same ethnic background or socioeconomic group. A neighbor is anyone. Anyone who needs your care and concern. Now, we are most comfortable uh, with and usually find it easier to care for those who are like us. But in today's society, we live side by side with people of many different backgrounds. We're surrounded by people who are different from us and who need our help. Being a good neighbor may, me, may mean stepping out of your comfort zone to help someone in need who is very different from you. It may be something small but helpful. Here's an example. Like holding open a hospital elevator door so a woman and her three children and a fourth in a stroller are able 
to board the elevator. Not a word of English is spoken, but you can tell by the smiles and the look of relief that your small act of kindness was appreciated. Like a good neighbor, you were there. Here's another true story of a Good Samaritan moment. Uh, a couple is standing in the returns line at a Walmart, and they strike up a conversation with a young man behind them who's holding his three-year-old niece. Now, there, there's plenty of time to chat, because this is Walmart. This is a Walmart return line. So <laughs> there's plenty of time to chat. The line isn't moving. Suddenly, the little girl tells her uncle that she has to use the bathroom. Awkward moment. Does the uncle give up his place in line and take his little niece into the men's restroom? No, the older lady volunteers to take the little girl into the women's washroom, which brings about a much more comfortable outcome for all. Wasn't much. It was a simple act of kindness to help someone in need, like a good neighbor. Now, our little church body, the Wisconsin Synod, is a good neighbor to people across this country and around the world. Your financial support of the Wisconsin Synod's Christian Aid and Relief Agency helps this program bring needed aid to victims of natural disasters, even in non-Christian countries, and to people that we otherwise couldn't reach. Supporting Christian Aid and Relief is another way to be a good neighbor. Now, if the Good Samaritan were alive and well today in Los Angeles, even if he were a millionaire, he'd be broke by the end of the week, maybe even arrested. This is a difficult statement, but it's true. Those people out there living on the sidewalk are our neighbors. The many homeless who, whom we see every day, they're our neighbors. Now, unfortunately, in this day and age, your love for your neighbor has to be tempered with concern for your own welfare. Here's a suggestion. Wish I'd thought of this myself. If you see someone with a sign that says, I'm hungry, sometimes you see that, you can drive through the nearest fast food restaurant, purchase a cheap meal, return to the hungry person, and give them something to eat without even having to get out of your car, without even having to roll the window down all the way. Or you can volunteer your time at the kitchens and shelters that provide meals for the homeless, or, you, or without having direct contact, you can help your homeless neighbor by supporting programs that help the homeless. For instance, there's a mobile shower van that travels around the city and it, it parks in certain locations and provides showers for those on the streets. And here's something else that you can do. You can pray for your neighbors. You can entrust them into the hands of the Almighty God, and prayer is powerful. When will your next Good Samaritan moment occur? When will you have the chance to go and do likewise? Remember, your neighbor is anyone who is in need. Motivated out of love and gratitude to God, you can use that Good Samaritan moment to render assistance, and at the same time, you'll be giving glory to God. Just like a good neighbor, will you be there? Amen. <laughs>